So I think you probably all are thinking the same thing. You have a burning question. I felt like I wouldn't be able to do the rest of my speaking tour without first addressing the burning question. And I got bombarded on Twitter today. Um, everyone has the same basic question, right? And that is, have I tasted haggis? And <laughs> the answer is no. I'm too scared. Um, because I made the mistake of reading how it's made first before <laughs> tasting it. I've been told you're supposed to do it the other way around because it's a lot less scary. I'm trying to build up the courage. And I, I've been told that the best way to do this is in a burger. Um, I don't know if that's actually true. No? Okay, there's a big disagreement in the room. Okay, so um, on the count of three, um, all those in favor of Haggis Burger? Nobody. Okay, Haggis for breakfast? Ah, oh, okay. Uh, are there other formulations I should try? I guess on toast. Very good. <laughs> How about a corporate sponsored haggis that is pretending to be an open haggis <laughs> and was launched this morning? Okay, so let's talk about the elephant in the room. And the elephant in the room is Libra. Uh, you probably all heard that this morning. Uh, Facebook announced their cryptocurrency, uh, Libra, and you know whenever the price of Bitcoin goes down, I get calls from friends and family, and they call me up and they go, "Are, are you okay? Is, is everything okay?" Um, this time, I actually got a call from a, f a friend's mom to ask me if I'm okay, and the price hasn't even dropped. But just the fact that Facebook launched the cryptocurrency led to the, are you okay? You, you holding in there? Is everything okay? Do we need to airlift you out of Europe? Um, I'm okay. I'm okay. I actually talked about this probably three years ago, that one day we would see this happen. And today's the day, right? So it's now happening it's happening but what it exactly happened and what can we talk about today so what happened was this morning facebook released a white paper not a cryptocurrency not a network not a currency not a project not an application a white paper and everybody's freaking out because they wrote a white paper um now there is a long road to go between white paper and production network available to two billion users wrapped in you know, candy-colored Farmville interface or whatever they are going to do with it next. But they released the white paper and everybody got really excited. So how many here have read the white paper? Oh, excellent, quite a few. I did a brief skim. I'll be honest with you, I did a brief skim. It's been a busy day. Um, I got a whole bunch of calls from journalists who wanted to talk about it, and I am not ready to talk about it because this is going to take a lot more study. I'm not going to talk too much about the technology today um, because we don't really know how it's going to play out. But I do want to talk about what changed. And what changed is everything. Everything changed this morning. Something we've been predicting for more than three years just happens, and it changes everything and it changes everything whether or not facebook is able to get this into production the mere fact that this white paper was dropped has now set the bar they dropped the gauntlet silicon valley is coming for banking in a big way and we predicted this was going to happen a lot of people in the space predicted this was going to happen and a lot of people thought it was going to be amazon first but turns out it was Facebook, which is much, much worse than anyone had imagined <laughs> possible. All right, so about the white paper. If you've, if you've taken a look, this is a collaboration of about, I think there was about 30 names on the top of the white paper. 
I have a feeling that the way this played out within Facebook, um, some people are saying this was a more than one year effort. Um, I have a feeling that what they did was they created this incubator sandbox innovation lab environment where they took 30, 40 really bright people, they locked them in the room, and they slid pizzas under the door <laughs> for a year, and out came a white paper. And, uh, and what that white paper represents is actually very impressive. It's very impressive in terms of the technology vision. So what they were able to do, these people are very serious about this, and very well informed about what we're doing in the cryptocurrency blockchain space. They cherry-picked some of the best features of the best cryptocurrencies, the state-of-the-art technology that existed out there, and then they advanced it a bit. Right? And they synthesized it in something that is quite impressive from a technology perspective. It's quite impressive because it's taken ideas like a virtual machine for execution of smart contracts and gas from Ethereum, um, a Merkle state tree that can be added to Merkle mountain ranges or the Ethereum state tree, uh, an embedded or intrinsic digital currency, similar to Bitcoin, a proof of authority federated network of validators, kind of similar to Ripple or EOS or a few of the other things that are kind of blockchains, but not quite. And a new consensus algorithm that is well, not exactly new. It's a Byzantine fault-tolerant consensus algorithm, um, which is not proof of work. But they say they want to move it to proof of stake. So some very interesting stuff there. And they mashed all of this together and created something that is very impressive from a technology perspective. And the reason it's very impressive is because of who did it, not because what was done. Like if I had released that white paper with 30 collaborators, everybody would have been like, oh, okay, there's another blockchain. But when a company that has two billion users does that, people understand that this could have a very, very big impact. So the next thing that happens is we see whether this survives first contact with Facebook corporate. Because at the moment, this is an incubated project. It's idealistic, it's progressive, it's aggressive in its vision. It is focused on being decentralized a bit now, and even more in the future. A bit permission now, permissionless in the future. Proof of authority now, proof of stake in the future. A very progressive, aggressive vision. And that vision is going to run straight into a whole bunch of MBAs and lawyers at Facebook headquarters who are going to go, whoa. <laughs> or maybe not. Let's see. It's going to be really interesting to see how much of this vision survives into deployment. And that's going to determine a lot of what happens next. And then even if it survives into deployment, at some point this is going to potentially become very successful very successful and a huge money maker and then the mbas are going to get very excited right there's some things in the white paper that are quite surprising for example the use of an association to segregate it from facebook a promise to not use the profile information on your facebook account um you have a facebook account i sure as hell don't um the information that's in your facebook profile and use that in collaboration with the currency, that's a no-no, right? And, and so at the moment, it says that information is not going to be shared. It's not going to be used for surveillance. It's not going to be used for any of these. Oh, one second, sorry. Um, yes, we are sending you this very important email to notify you of changes to our terms of conditions. <laughs> Please read the following 600 pages of gibberish. Uh, to understand how we completely removed due process and any of your privacy. Thank you very much, the Facebook team. Okay, so that, that email just came to me from the future. It was written by an MBA, and it's going to change all of those promises the moment this becomes successful. You think I'm kidding? Look at what happened to WhatsApp, right? Look at what happened to WhatsApp. The founders of that company that started with the same kind of ideal, idealistic vision left foregoing hundreds of millions of dollars in 
pays and bonuses, and then said, use Signal. Use Signal. Do not use WhatsApp. If you're, an, if you're a dissident, if you're an activist, if you're a political operative, if your communication confidentiality is going to make the difference between you surviving or not, which means if you're any one of the millions of people who marched in Hong Kong this week, yeah, use Signal. Don't use WhatsApp. Um, will something similar happen? I'm a bit of a cynic. I think that large corporations have a tendency to swallow innovation and rip out all of the disruptive things and spit out something that is neutered and profit-making and exploits their users, because that's their obligation. Their obligation is to shareholders. But we'll see. Maybe it won't be. So that's what happened on the technical front this morning. And now everybody's trying to solve what I call the three-body problem, which is, until now, we were looking at this space as the interaction between two major forces. On one side, we have government, nation-state money, fiat, as we derisively call it in the crypto space. And on the other side, we have the people's money, right? open, borderless cryptocurrency that is free for everyone to use. And these two forces are orbiting each other and exerting pressure on each other. Right now, you know, crypto is a tiny little speck of an asteroid, right? And fiat is a nice big planet full of very, very successful life forms. And those life forms are looking up at the sky and going, "What's that shiny thing? It seems to be getting bigger." Um, you know, the experience of the dinosaurs. It's like, don't worry, it's pretty. Look at how, how nice the sunset looks. Um, it keeps getting bigger. Solving the two-body problem and trying to figure out from a political perspective what happens when nation-states and open cryptocurrencies collide is difficult enough. We can't tell because different nations are positioning themselves in different ways. Some are freaked out by it, and they ban it outright. China's banned it. 1,726 times so far, <laughs> all ineffectively. India's banned it, well, kind of twice, right? Um, Ecuador was one of the first to ban it, and just like completely. And yet, in many advanced nations, uh, cryptocurrency has actually been thriving. Many of what we call free societies, the idea of banning a form of private currency is constitutionally problematic. Right? So, uh, both the United States Constitution as well as the United Kingdom's Constitution protect freedom. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah, you don't have one. But anyway, the Magna Carta, let's say, protects freedom of speech, and, and money is a form of political speech. So that's something that's cherished in free societies. It's not so easy to ban this thing. So there's a lot of this tension. This morning, there was a big discussion on Twitter um, that I reluctantly got involved in, which was about whether Facebook or whether Facebook's Libra is a cryptocurrency or not. All right? well, let's take a quick poll, all those who say it is a cryptocurrency, all those who say it is not a cryptocurrency, all those who haven't decided yet. That is okay. Well, it turns out I don't think that question really makes sense. And the reason it doesn't make sense is because Facebook's Libra is a new thing. It's a corpo currency. It's a corporate digital currency. And we haven't seen corporate digital currencies since the opium wars. We haven't seen corporate digital currencies since medieval feudalism and the Medici. Right? So how how fitting how fitting that on the dawn of corporate neo-feudalism, one of the leading neo-feudalist corporate states, super states of corporations, Facebook, the nation of Facebook, the super nation of Facebook, is launching its own currency. And things are going to get very interesting now. They are going to get very interesting for a number of reasons, but the main reason is that we now have a three-point standoff. It is now money of the corporations, money of the people, 
and money of government. All three will exist. None of them are going away. In fact, there will be more joining. The door has been opened. Facebook is the first of the fangs. The rest of them are bearing their fangs and ready to go. Fangs, if you don't know, is Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google, the billion-dollar tech companies of Silicon Valley. But it's not just them, because it's also Twitter and Uber and Airbnb. The era of internet currencies just opened, and Silicon Valley is coming for the banks in a way that's never happened before. Now, the bankers have been very, very comfortable until now. I went to a conference in Zurich speaking to banking executives in 2014, and I told them, listen, instead of hiring blockchain consultants, to tell you how to square the circle and undisrupt the disruption and pretend to do blockchain, you should hire a former music executive from the music industry and ask them, what did it feel like when the internet came for your industry? When did you realize that you couldn't do anything about it? And how did you feel when you started losing your entire industry to Apple? And guess what? The banks had 10 years to figure this shit out. They had 10 years to try to figure out how they're going to handle digital currencies. And just like the music industry should have made a deal with Napster. And instead, they fought it tooth and nail and handed the entire industry to Apple. The banking industry should have made a deal with Bitcoin. It was the cuddly little gecko of cryptocurrencies. <laughs> and Facebook is a freaking triceratops. And it's coming for their industry. This is going to disrupt a lot of things. The really weird thing about it is that the first to be affected by this are retail banks. Retail banks, not the big bad investment banks that make shady deals to bail out dictators and stuff like that. The banks that actually serve customers. Most of the big investment banks have stopped taking checking and savings customers from the consumer cycle for the last four or five years. They don't want that. You people don't pay enough, right? Not worthy of banking. But retail banks, the corner bank, the branch where you know the banker, or at least you know them every time you have to go and discuss why your overdraft is ballooning again. But those retail banks that actually serve customers that have been delivering banking to the unbanked and underbanked, gradually expanding their reach, they're going to get hit hard by this new phenomenon. They're going to get hit hard by Facebook. Because Facebook has not only two billion users, but two billion users of whom they know all of their preferences, all of the behavior patterns. And they can use that to drop the cost of banking, wrap it in a candy-colored, cute user interface, so that every time you make a purchase, the application jumps in and tickles your dopamine receptors a bit, <laughs> and encourages you to do certain things, or not do other things, right? and plays with you like a little mouse in a psychology experiment, where you can't see that you are in the maze, because the walls are too high. This is going to be very, very interesting as it plays out, but also to those of us who have been paying attention to the rise of techno-neo-feudalism, it's terrifying. It's terrifying because Facebook is going to be effective at disrupting regulation in a way the banks have not been able to. It's terrifying because, among other things, Facebook is now going after central banks. And, yeah, they have a basket of currencies, and they're going to create some kind of stablecoin thing on this basket of currencies. But that stablecoin is going to be stable vis-a-vis -vis your local currency that's hyperinflating. I talked about that this morning. The idea, imagine you're in India or Argentina, and you're the government, and you want to follow an inflationary devaluation policy, and your population has moved 10% of the economy onto Libra and can take their savings and hide them in the hard currency of Facebook. 
well, it's not really a hard card. See, it doesn't really have a monetary policy, or so they say, but it's harder than the Argentinian peso. It's harder than the Turkish lira. It's harder than the Indian rupee. It's harder than more than a hundred currencies around the world. And suddenly, the central banks have lost one of the big levers of power they have over the economy. What are they going to do? Ban Facebook? Shut down 10% of their economy? They're going to try. They're going to try exactly like they've been trying to ban Facebook during protests, and coups, dictatorships, revolutions, and they're going to fail. They're going to try to regulate Facebook. Imagine the poor regulators who get paid like nothing in their tweed suits, academics from the economics ministry, facing an army of Wall Street lawyers descending on their tiny little country, filling the parking lot of their local airport with 17 Gulf Streams in a row, and saying, let's talk about what we're going to do to your economy. <laughs> if you didn't realize what Facebook is planning on doing, is consumer retail level SDRs. Who here knows what an SDR is? A few people. Yeah, you get my meaning? The International Monetary Fund is a global institution that is not controlled by governments, that uses contributions of members that they put in a basket of currencies to issue a pseudo-currency called special drawing rights. They are part of the international framework of free-floating exchange rates, and they are the lender of last resort for governments. And they do so in a very predatory manner, where they impose extreme neoliberal austerity on the governments that fall into their clutches. And they asset strip their industries and their water plants and their railroads and their telecommunications companies. Well, guess what? Facebook's going to do that now. Because if you think about what Libra is, it is a special drawing rights pseudo-currency drawn on a basket of currency that is funded directly by consumer activity in the same countries where the government is going to come back and ask them for a loan or try to curtail their activity. This is very serious stuff. We just went post-national. The power to control money that used to be the exclusive prerogative of the states got kicked in the nuts by Bitcoin and decapitated by Libra this morning. The central bank control of a monetary policy ended this morning, because more and more technology companies, which currently are worth a trillion dollars, once given the ability or taking the ability to mint their own money, will radically transform their business models will use that to generate more money than you can ever imagine. And very, very soon, they will dwarf the GDP of at least a third of the nations on this planet. And when the IMF comes calling, most governments cower in fear, but they have no idea how much worse it is going to be when Facebook comes calling, or Google, or Apple. Maybe even Twitter can take down a few governments. Yeah, it's big enough. Why not? Pretty soon, Uber will be dictating not just to the taxi drivers, but to the local council, too. Maybe even the cabinet of ministers. We are looking at a new world in which three forces are going to be competing. Money of the people, money of the state, and money of the corporations. That is a crossroads. We have to make some very careful choices. Now, I am hopeful. I'm hopeful for a number of reasons. I'm hopeful because they're actually going to make a contribution to the technology, whether they want to or not. I'm hopeful because they're going to introduce a billion people to the wrong kind of cryptocurrency, just like AOL introduced almost a billion people to the wrong kind of internet. <laughs> and here's where it gets tricky. Because at this point, we need to decide how we differentiate on principles. I've talked about the fundamental principles that I care about in blockchains, 
Sometimes I call them the five pillars. Sometimes I call them the eight criteria. I lose count all the time. So it's somewhere between five and eight. But you should always ask yourself about a system that is trying to take over the foundational technology of money in your world. Is it open? What does open mean? Is it open so that anyone can access it without vetting? Anyone can participate in the network without vetting? Anyone can send a transaction without providing ID? Is it? We don't know yet. We'll see. The white paper is. We'll see what the currency actually does. Is it borderless? I can tell you right now it's not going to be borderless. There is only one borderless global cryptocurrency of any value and meaning today, and that's Bitcoin. And it's maybe as good at the, as the U.S. dollar at being borderless. But Facebook is not going to be in China. I can guarantee you that Libra is not going to launch in China, because they're going to have their own alternative that's going to be launched by WeChat. And it's going to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the People's Republic of China Central Politburo. You know, kind of like Facebook is a wholly owned subsidiary of the NSA. <laughs> and it's not going to launch in Russia either, because like hell are they going to give up their monetary sovereignty to a dude from Silicon Valley. And it's not going to launch in a bunch of other places where there's a lot of unbanked people who actually need this. So it's not going to be borderless. In fact, quite the opposite. We've now entered the era of Cold War currency wars. The world is about to have an iron curtain drop in currencies like we've never seen before. We're going to see a fundamental split between East and West in the evolution of state-based currencies, corporate-based currencies, and open cryptocurrencies. And of the three, only open cryptocurrencies go everywhere. It's probably not going to be neutral. Neutrality requires the protocol to allow transactions from anyone to anyone for any purpose. And a lot of open cryptocurrencies do that. I very much doubt Libra can do that. Because the moment they start doing that, the subpoenas will start flying. And the most important thing about a subpoena is knowing where to serve it. Right? And that's easy. They have an office which accepts service of process, and that's where they're going to send the subpoenas. Where do you send the Bitcoin subpoenas? Aha! You can send them to 127.0.0.1 colon slash dev slash null. We will process them immediately. <laughs> so it's not going to be neutral. It's not going to be censor persistent because large corporations like that that are bound by jurisdictional regulations are obliged under law to censor transactions. You cannot send a transaction on a network like that to an Iranian, to a Venezuelan, to a North Korean, or receive one from a Russian or a Chinese citizen without properly vetting who they are, who their parents are, when they were born, where they live, which companies they own, who they are related to. This happens every time you try to do a wire transfer. They are not going to be immutable. They say in the white paper they are immutable. The moment you have a transaction there that funded some abhorrent and inexcusable activity on the open, neutral, borderless network, subpoenas are going to start flying, and the immutable network is going to get muted pretty damn fast. Pretty easy to do when you have a consortium of validators with no cost to modifying past history. Proof of work actually makes it impossible, even if 100% of the validators, the miners, collude, to go back and change the history without expending the same amount of energy. Which means that every day that passes, you are looking at an energy cost that increases so fast, that very, very quickly, within a day or two, it is unapproachable. It is an undue burden. It is almost impossible, even if you could find and coerce all of the miners. They wouldn't be able to do it. 
It's not won't, it's can't, and can't is much better than won't. So it's not going to be immutable. It might be auditable and transparent. We don't yet know. But it, if, if it is auditable and transparent, it's not going to be private. Which means that we are probably only a few years from launch before there is a giant freaking leak, and all of your financial data are belong to us. <laughs> Again. Right? Because if it's in the blockchain and it's stored in a transparent manner, and you don't have any privacy controls, you know, the kind that criminals use, at least they're smart about using privacy, well, then what's going to happen is all of that information will be leaked. So all of your purchases will now be visible to all of your friends and family. And, you know, we probably all have a very good friend who we've made a pact with that says, look, if I get hit by a bus, I need you to get my laptop, <laughs> I need you to erase my browsing history, <laughs> and I need you to shred all of my bank statements before my mom gets to the house. Are we, we good? You know what I mean? Because financial privacy is a human right. Society doesn't work as a panopticon. We have secrets because we're social animals. We have secrets because that gives us the freedom to express our freaky nature. Because we all differ a bit from the expectations and conformities of society. Or at least I fucking hope we do. Because if we don't, if we don't, what kind of society is that? Where you have to absolutely conform to all of the expectations of your stuck-up neighbors, right? Individuality, expression, freedom is privacy. And so we don't want our financial records blasted to the world, but that's what's going to happen next. So it's going to be auditable and transparent, maybe, but not very private. This is not the kind of blockchain that I'm interested in, but more importantly, once again, as I've said many times before, we stand at a fork in the road, because on the one hand we have surveillance money, and on the other hand we have free, open, and private people's money. And guess what's going to happen with this new currency? The path to cashless societies, the timetable for cashless societies, just got accelerated. And cashless societies are nothing to celebrate. Cashless societies are societies without freedom. Are societies without democracy, are societies without robustness, fragile societies without the possibility of an exit plan or of a relief valve. There are societies in which one election is the last election. You just have to get it wrong once. You just have to stay at home and say, I don't care about politics. And all of the kooky old people go out and they vote for an orange man or Brexit or some shit like that. And then you're like, what the hell happened? But in a world in which you don't have cash, it's much worse than that. Because now, the government, the corporation, the payment processor can decide that you did something bad and turn off your financial future. Make it so that you can't even buy food, let alone pay your rent or your heating. You think this isn't happening? It's happening right now in Hong Kong. It's happening right now in China with the Sesame credit score system. And if you think it's not coming to a country like yours, study up on European history. 1918 through 1945. Fascinating shit. <laughs> we thought the UK learned that lesson. From what I've been seeing lately, uh-uh. Trying to repeat all of those. Great. Sometimes you have to teach the lesson twice. And what are we going to do in the crypto space? We're going to start differentiating. Expect over the next couple of years for a lot of the crypto projects to get very, very focused about what their principles are and how they differentiate now that there is a lot of confusion. Now that we're dealing with the 18-dimensional partial differential equation of a three-body problem. Oh, everything's pulling on everything else. And <laughs> In six degrees of freedom, it's very complicated. Who knows what happens next? Look, Facebook went into India. Ah, India wants to devalue. Some of the Indian people are going for crypto. Others are being blocked. What happens next? Nobody knows. 
It's going to get very complicated. So if you're in a crypto project, you need to decide what your principles are. It's interesting because I've been expressing the same consistent principles for the last seven years. And <laughs> thank you. The reason is really simple. It takes too much bloody homework to come up with other ideas and try to remember how to be consistent with what I said before if I'm not following what I actually believe in. Some people in our industry noticed that recently. Inconsistencies happen very, very quickly. Some projects within crypto recently faced that kind of fork in the road, and they decided to focus on different principles to try to change the trajectory of some of the projects we care about. Right? I've been hearing lately one of these projects is all about payment systems, very, very inexpensive, cheap payments at the expense of decentralization. And privacy, apparently, to the people who are following this, is only useful for illegal criminal money launderers who are trying to support wash trading and bucket shops. Ooh. <laughs> now, if that's the road you want to go down, that light you see is not the light at the end of the tunnel. That's an oncoming Facebook train that already has the principle-less privacy less market staked out only they already have two billion users lots of money and lots of technology people who are going to run right over you if you haven't differentiated based on your principles or worse you don't have any principles or you decided because you recently hired an mba who's really interested in shareholder return on investment, that the best way to do that would be to shed a few of these silly, idealistic principles that these engineer dudes or women have decided to support, then guess what? You start shedding principles, and now you're facing Facebook. And what is Facebook, if not the world's most awesome principle-shedding machine? that started with very few and then has developed a mechanism for shedding them faster than you can imagine with billions of dollars of marketing tickling your dopamine receptors telling you don't worry the future is candy colored and bright as long as we're still profitable they can shed principles faster than you with more money than you with better user interfaces than you and with a bigger user base than you. So if your game is shed principles to make profit, that's a game you're not going to win at. Facebook is going to win that game. And they're going to win it over PayPal, they're going to win it over JP Morgan Chase, and they sure as hell are going to win it over a little ragtag crypto project that said, we don't need privacy. We want to be a fast payment network that collaborates with law enforcement and gives out information for surveillance companies for everyone to share. Figure out what your principles are. Everybody is now going to have to stop, take a breath, and figure out how to differentiate. And it's actually pretty easy. It's really, really easy. If you're going to get into a fight with someone who doesn't know how to hold principles, if you're going to get into a fight with a corporation that is not immoral, because that requires having negative morality, but amoral, which means no moral guidance whatsoever, a lack of any moral compass, because morality doesn't even enter the equation. Morality is not on the spreadsheet. Morality did not enter the ROI equation. If you are going to enter a fight with them, differentiate on the thing they can't compete with. Make yourself the one project or align yourself with the one project that is truly open, borderless, neutral, censorship-resistant, transparent, auditable, private, immutable. And there are a few of those, I think. I expect the privacy currencies are going to get quite a run, because now suddenly there is a reason to really focus on privacy, and that's because Facebook won't. So, things just got really interesting. As a technologist, I am so excited. I've been jumping up and down all day. 
I can't wait to see how this plays out, because that's been my lifelong fascination, watching technological systems interact with society and change the world, and watch these developments roll out, and see if I can pick up a few clues as to where these things are going, to have that vision. That's been my life's goal. As a technologist, I've been jumping up and down. As a human being, I am horrified. I am horrified at the fact that we are about to open a door to a future that is truly dystopian, that is truly terrifying, and give an amount of power to some of the most ruthless, unaccountable corporations out there to not just fight against government, but in many cases join hand in hand in making sure that while we are exploited by ruthless politicians on one side, we are exploited by ruthless business people on the other. An unholy alliance between capital, corporation, and state is called fascism. Only this isn't your grandpa's fascism. This is a whole new neo-feudal environment that we have never seen before. And a lot of people are going to make the fundamental mistake of thinking that because it doesn't come in a leather uniform designed by uh, a fantastic German designer, Hugo Boss, right, with clashing colors and caricatures parades and screaming into megaphones, and with all of the symbolism of that, it's not fascism. Fascism today comes in a slick user interface, in beautiful colors, accessible 24-7 through a browser at your most convenient location, on your phone 24-7, whether your phone is on or off. <laughs> and it is part of your life. It's what connects you to Grandpa and allows you to share photos with Grandpa. That same Grandpa who fought Nazis. <laughs> it's the ultimate irony. We need to be very careful about what we do next. This is deadly serious stuff. Society is not ready for this because we've never been here before. And while I am fascinated to watch, at the same time I'm deeply troubled. I'm not afraid because I don't think Bitcoin can compete. I'm afraid because I believe that a lot of people don't care. A lot of people will go for the easy, the convenient, the mindless, the repetitive, the seductive, the hypnotizing rhythm of a Facebook feed, and they will lose their freedom and their future. Thank you.